Thanks very much indeed. I'd like to start with a question that I imagine everybody in this room has been grappling with for many years. And the question is this. What can traditional archery teach us about international development, <laughs> humanitarian aid, and peace building? Now, by traditional archery, I mean, of course, wooden bows and arrows, the sort of thing that might conjure an image of Robin Hood or the Battle of Agincourt. And by international development, peace building, and humanitarian aid, I mean those efforts that charities and governments often overtake in fragile countries. So think building schools, um, infrastructure development programs, civil society reform schemes, that kind of thing. Now, I admit that the question might seem somewhat off kilter, um, but by day, I run this company called Aleph, and what we do is measure the impact of these sorts of programs. And by night, quite often during the day when I get a bit distracted, I make traditional English longbows. We've all got our thing. I trust there's no judgment. This is TEDx after all. Um, so since the theme of the series is storytelling, I've got a short story to share with you all. Last year, I travelled to Nuristan, which is a province in the northeast corner of Afghanistan. It's a part of the country that's been isolated really for millennia, largely thanks to its hostile uh, geography, but also because the people that live there are very, very, very independent. Some of the best empire builders the world has ever seen had a crack at Nuristan and couldn't get in. Alexander the Great had a go and failed. Tamerlane failed some 1,600 years later. And for almost 1,000 years, Nuristan withheld the advance of Islam converting only at the point of a sword in 1896, when its name changed from Kafiristan, the land of the unbelievers, to Nuristan, the euphemistic land of light. And subsequently, neither the Soviets nor the recent US-led coalition was able to secure any form of lasting peace or security in the region. And to this very day, it retains a highly distinctive cultural heritage and identity. It's famous for its spectacular wooden architecture and for its intricate wood carving. It's famous for its costume, for its myth cycles, its stories, its dancing, its music. But perhaps less well-known is the fact that people here still practice a form of traditional archery that hasn't changed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And if that's not cool, I don't know what is. But Nuristan is also one of the poorest provinces um, in Afghanistan. Almost two decades of continual conflict, longer in fact, have meant that um, people live here, the majority of them live well below the poverty line. Life expectancy is short, and there's barely a paved kilometre of road in a province that's pretty much the size of Cornwall and Devon combined. But it's a place that I grew up reading about, in fact, it was one of the reasons I quit my job in London in 2012 to move to Afghanistan. And I spent four years in Kabul um, learning how to do Nuristani woodworking in the evenings in the hope of somehow qualifying myself as a cultural expert so that I could travel to Nuristan and work on the conservation of historic, beautiful buildings uh, like the one you see on the previous image. But it was never to be because of the insecurity. To make matters worse, in 2021, as I'm sure everybody remembers, the Taliban swept to power. It seemed for many people in Afghanistan and indeed around the world like a nightmare had come true. Women and girls were swiftly banned from education, from the workspace, from public places, and human rights were being trammeled more or less at every turn. The Taliban even started destroying musical instruments and they banned music and singing and dancing. The last time the Taliban were in power, in 2001, you'll remember that they blew up the two giant Buddha statues that had stood guard over the Bamiyan Valley for many hundreds of years. It seemed as if Afghanistan's very heritage and identity were under threat once more. But with the withdrawal of international forces, the war in Afghanistan effectively ended. And that meant that large parts of the country that had previously been inaccessible due to insecurity were for the first time open for business. It meant that charities could extend their programs into parts of the country that had been inaccessible. And unfortunate though the circumstances were, I thought, well, here potentially is a window, a brief period where I might be able to go back to Nuristan 
and to see whether or not this idea for a cultural protection project is going to be possible. Now, I thought I was quite nervous about going back to Afghanistan under the Taliban control. We've all seen the news stories. But then I had a genius idea. I thought, well, if I take a bow and arrow with me, perhaps I'll be considered such an oddity, and I know I am here, that, <laughs> that perhaps it will deflect unwarranted attention and I'll be given greater latitude to move about than if I was coming there with an ostensibly worthier cause in mind. So I agonised over the design of my bow. Now, this picture behind me might look rather simple, but I, you have to trust me when I say it's an absolute masterpiece. Um, <laughs> I'd like to draw your attention to the very clever uh, joint at the handle, so I could take this apart and put it on an aeroplane, sling it in the back of a car and carry it with me. The, the arrows that you can see on the far left-hand side of the image here have little feathers uh, neatly glued onto them. And every aspect of this was agonized over. I needed something that was lightweight, but also something that was long enough to resist being broken when people sort of stretched it and pulled it in a variety of different directions. So I was very pleased with the end result. I made it to Kabul without too much trouble and made straight for the ministries to get my permission letter. So you have to get permission from Kabul before you can travel any further afield. And these letters were given to me quite quickly and easily. I was struck by how receptive government officials were to these sorts of cultural projects. At a time when they were banning things like music and the dancing, they were actively encouraging the conservation of historic buildings and monuments in other parts of the country. So my idea to travel to Nuristan to look at old buildings and wood carving traditions and to take part in the archery, as ridiculous as that might have sounded, actually was met with great approval. And I was given permission to move on pretty quickly. Culture, I was learning, opens doors in some very surprising places. We then set off uh, from Kabul to Nuristan, and along the way, we passed lots and lots of villages where archery ranges had been set up. It seemed as if archery was very much a, a living part of the region's heritage and identity. When we got to the sort of end destination, I set about learning as much as I possibly could about the archery. Um, the rules are, are, are pretty straightforward. You have two sticks stuck in the ground about 100 meters apart, and you fire one arrow from each end, aiming for the stick at the other end. When I was there, there were two teams of 12 uh, archers competing against one another at any given moment. And to say that health and safety wasn't a front of mind issue <laughs> would be a very gross understatement. So you can imagine that by the time the last person is firing his arrow at the target, he's effectively firing into a group of 23 other archers who have already fired their arrows and are waiting for his arrow to land at their feet. And that's to say nothing for all the children, the livestock, and the other spectators who have gathered around to get the prime view of the arrows hitting the target. I've got a very short clip here to, to show you, just to give a sense of what it's like. Hopefully the audio will work. Next child running under the arrow there. Well, I'm glad you chuckled at that. Uh, that's terrifying, by the way. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think the idea behind it is that if you, you know, hold your hat in front of the target or flash a mirror or a mobile phone, that somehow you'll guide or, or help your, your teammates to hit the mark. But, I mean, this was just a practice session. There weren't many people there. The actual event, there were lots of people around there. And apparently, injury uh, and worse is not unheard of. So it was with, I think, a fairly understandable degree of nervousness and trepidation that I sort of stepped up and threw my hat into the ring and said, let me take part. Remember, at sort of 100 meters, there isn't a huge margin of error. So if your arrow is either side, just by a fraction, the chances of hitting somebody are extremely high. So at the beginning of the competition, everybody sort of steps up and they, they sort of bring out their bows and their arrows, and they're all you know, testing the arrows for straightness, stringing their bows, giving them a good old stretch. And I got mine out, and I thought, well, everybody is going to be blown away by this incredible thing I've made, this wonderful magic bow that combines all these incredible features. 
Um, and I was wrong. They weren't, in the, they weren't in the least bit impressed by it. Um, the general gist of it was that it was too weak and too big and wouldn't be any use whatsoever. But the, the, thing, the thing that they, that they took the greatest offence at was the fact that my arrows didn't have big sharp points on the end as theirs did. They had rubber safety blunts on them. <laughs> Rather sensibly, I thought. That was a good precaution to take under the circumstances. But no, that, that was considered to be somehow incredibly feeble. Um, so I, I think I was the underdog from the start. And I must admit, I gave as good as I got. I looked, at, I looked at their bows, and I thought they were somewhat short. They only sort of came up to about here. Quite simple. Um, and the arrows, they didn't have any feathers on them, so they really are just a, a piece of bamboo with a little notch cut at one end and then an almighty spike at the other. And I thought, you know, I'm going to show you guys a thing or two. So I sort of... <laughs> stepped up to the mark, drew my bow, let fly. And the arrow hit the target first time, split the stick in half, and everybody was just flabbergasted, complete silence. Obviously didn't happen, by the way. <laughs> Not at all, very far from it. The arrow didn't even make it halfway down the range, hit a rock, <laughs> smashed into a thousand pieces. They were absolutely right. The bow was a complete load of rubbish. Um, and it became very immediately obvious that this, this imported idea of perfection, this bow that I'd spent so much time building and making, agonising over the design about, clearly wasn't up to scratch. There was no match whatsoever for the local bows. So I beat a pretty hasty retreat, and under the very kind and patient guidance of a local carpenter, built a new bow in the local style. And what was wonderful about that experience was that, as cheesy as this might sound, he and I could communicate with one another, though we didn't have really much more than a single word in common because we were using the same tools, we were using materials that we were accustomed to using, and it was just a great little experience. It did absolutely nothing to improve the quality of my shooting. Um, the bow still, the bow turned out rather well and it's still in my office, but uh, I decided to bow out of the competition when one of my arrows um, landed very, very close indeed to a small group of children. There was just a little voice in my head that said, if you keep going, it's probably not going to end very well. So I stepped back. But the final ignominy of the whole experience, the final humility, was that uh, I wanted to give my bow to somebody, my original bow to somebody, at the end of the tournament, as if to say, you know, thank you very much for, for the kindness and the enormous hospitality I've been shown. But no one wanted it. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't give this thing away. And I tried. I tried really hard. But nobody wanted it. In the end, I think some poor chap took it off me and probably slung it in his bread oven the next morning. And then, you know, we won't speak of that again. But at this point, you're probably asking yourselves, what on earth does any of this have to do with international development, humanitarian aid, and peace building? Well, this wouldn't be a TED talk if I didn't try and distill some wisdom and some key insights from, from the story. I'll come to those in a moment. But for a bit of context, though, culture is often overlooked as a means of development or of humanitarian recovery. It's often considered a luxury. How can you possibly invest in projects to document and protect cultural heritage or to work with culture in contexts when people need food, shelter, water, and all of these other sorts of things? Well, my message isn't particularly new or, or complicated. Culture is actually a critical driver of precisely these sorts of development initiative. And there are three reasons for this. The first is that context is everything. There's a tendency to overlook the importance of local knowledge, local insight, in favour of so-called international best practice. So just like my bow and my arrows, which shattered into a thousand pieces when I missed the target... I'm wary of anything that claims universal application. Just because an education program was very successful in one country doesn't mean for a moment it's going to work in another. And just because a system of government was particularly effective in one place certainly doesn't mean it's going to be exported to another place just as easily. The second reason is that culture creates opportunities to work in contexts or at times when other types of project might seem more difficult. Remember at a time when the Taliban and, and Western governments were, and still are, at loggerheads with one another over important issues like human rights, it felt at the time that there was quite a permissive space for cultural programs. Culture can be seen as non-threatening and, and can therefore 
create opportunities for engaging with people. I was able to have really surprisingly frank conversations with people that began with archery and ended in topics like religion and faith. I was quizzed very insistently about my own faith on, on a number of occasions, but very politely. And I had incredible conversations about pre-Islamic pagan belief systems. And all of this with people who have been branded religious hardline fundamentalists. Culture creates opportunities to engage. The third reason, and the final and perhaps most important reason, is that culture untangles that complicated relationship that exists between the sort of traditional aid giver and aid recipient model. It allows you to engage as equals. Now, I'm not starry-eyed about this. I'm completely alive to the chasm of inequality that, that lies between someone like me and then the people I was staying with in Yuristan. But there were genuinely moments where we were engaging with one another as equals, be that shoulder to shoulder at the archery range or dodging arrows as they landed at our feet. And these three rules, if, if, if any, must be the bases of development programs, humanitarian aid and peace building. If we don't align our, in, our uh, initiatives with these things, they're destined to fail. And with that, I end. Thank you very much indeed.